Thank you, choir, for that music. Now, today we're doing something I've not done before. I'm giving you a double header today, two sermons. It's your lucky day. The first sermon is entitled A Tale of Two Cities, and the second one is Living a Life of Integrity. And actually, the first sermon is really just a sequel to the sermon from three weeks ago when we had the story behind the story. And it really all started um, actually back in January and with the general conference session that was postponed and we had a, we did vote and we had a special general conference executive committee meeting this week, seven o'clock on Wednesday morning, 7 a.m. to accommodate all those around the world. And this is what was presented to us. I did some screenshots. Whereas the action taken by the General Conference Executive Committee on January 12, just a few weeks ago, to postpone the 2020 General Conference session to June 6 to 11, that's an important day, to June 6 to 11 of 2022 in Indianapolis was based on the availability of the venue confirmed by the Indiana Convention Center. Whereas on January 29 at 4.30 PM without any warning, Visit Indy, the official host of Indianapolis contacted the general conference session management team informing them of the non-availability of the already voted dates of June 6 to 11 of 2022. And whereas the available dates suggested by the Indiana, Indiana Convention Center, changing to Thanksgiving and Christmas in 2021 are really impractical dates for holding a general conference session. And whereas the St. Louis Convention Center is providentially available on June 6 to 11 of 2022. It's recommended to postpone the 2020 GC session to 2022. Well, what's really interesting about this, let me go to the next slide. I, know, I labeled this the tale of two cities is because when, when, the, Indy, when the Indy Convention Center contacted the GC, in January and said, sorry, if we're no longer available, even though it had been verbally committed, the GC was really kind of puzzled as to what to do. And so they contacted the city of St. Louis and the GC is already scheduled for there. The 2025 session will be in St. Louis. When they contacted 
city of St. Louis about the possibility of having it there also in 2022. And they said, well, we'll have to check our calendar. And the only dates open, the only dates available for June 6 to 11 as already scheduled for it to be in Indianapolis. Absolutely amazing. And then they said, and oh, by the way, you can have the whole facility, everything for that week, you can have it for $1. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Well, what was really interesting was as Ted Wilson was explaining this and in the GC session in Indianapolis for last year, there was all kinds of plans for evangelistic meetings with it is written just a whole lot of a whole host of plans that had been made, then rescheduled to this year. And conferences and unions are always excited to be able to be the host for a GC session. Ted Wilson was very apologetic to the Lake Union and to Indiana for moving it to St. Louis which took, takes it to a different conference, a different union. And as the, the GC, as, as the union presidents each spoke, I was really impressed with what Maurice Valentine, who is the president of the Lake Union Conference, and what he said, it really, it really struck home with me because we have been studying Paul. And he said, he said, it reminds me of in Acts 17 and 18, when Paul wanted to go to one city and God said, no, you're going over there. And it was in light of that, that they're very, very accepting of, no, we're going over there. God has a plan. And then Gary Thurber stepped up and said, and he's president of Mid-America and he stepped up and he said, you know, we're only separated by a river. We're only separated by the Mississippi River. Why don't we make this a joint project? And it was just the, the comments online on our Zoom meeting. It was just the, the comments that were being said. It was just amazing. The, the camaraderie that came together. And as I went back into Acts 17 and 18, I, and just thinking about God telling Paul, you know, you're going over there. I know you want to be there, but you're going over there. And how that, that brought the gospel message to the Gentiles. And all we can do is think about providentially, what is the story behind this? And I thought, I have just got to share this with you in light of what we've been studying in the book of Acts, how God works things out providentially so we're, we're looking at a tale of two cities in the years 2021 and 2022. We don't know what the end of this story is going to be. But we'll be around. We want to be around. And if we're still on this earth, if God hasn't come, we'll be around to find out what God really has in mind for this. Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh, we're just so in all and the way you work things out providentially and what you have done for the upcoming GC session and how you've opened doors in St. Louis and the, the price tag for it, everything. We have no idea what, what's gonna be happening, but you do. And Lord, we are just in awe. We're in awe of the stories as we've studied Paul and how you work providentially there with Paul in prison. Lord, we know that you're in control here. And now as we continue in our study today in Acts 24, the life of Paul, a life of integrity, we just ask that you help us all to have a better understanding of what it means to live a life of integrity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. A life of integrity, guilty of godliness. Years ago, the 20th Century Fox 
they advertised for a salesman and they got this reply from, a, from an applicant. And he wrote, I am at present selling furniture at the address listed below. You may judge my ability as a salesman if you will stop in to see me at any time, pretending that you are interested in buying furniture. And when you come in, you can identify me by my red hair and I will have no way of identifying you. Such salesmanship as I exhibit during your visit therefore will be no more than my usual work day approach and not a special effort to impress a prospective employer. As I read that and I was looking at the rest of the article, there is no record as to whether that young man got that job or not, but he definitely demonstrated a quality that is rare and although it shouldn't be, and that quality is integrity. Integrity, it's defined as the practice of being honest and showing a consistent and uncompromising adherence to strong moral and ethical principles and values. That's easy to talk about integrity, much more difficult to practice it. And in 1980 Sports Illustrated article, a well-known athlete said, fame is a vapor, popularity is an accident and money takes wings. The only thing that endures is character. The well-known athlete was OJ Simpson. Integrity is regarded as the honesty and truthfulness and or accuracy of one's actions. And I learned this week that one of the best known phrases in the history of the United States Supreme Court is this, I may not be able to define it, but I know it when I see it. Dates back to 1964 when the Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, he used those words to describe his threshold test for obscenity. I may not be able to define it, but I know it when I see it. Integrity is something that we may not easily define, but we know it when we see it, don't we? A small boy was on the witness stand in an important lawsuit. The prosecuting attorney cross-examined him, and then he delivered what he thought would be a crushing blow to that boy's testimony. That attorney says, your father has been telling you how to testify, hasn't he? And the little boy quietly says and quickly replies, yes. And now, now the attorney says triumphantly, just tell us how your father told you to testify. Well, the boy said modestly, dad told me the lawyers would try to tangle me in my testimony. And, and if I would just be careful to tell the truth, I could repeat the same thing every time. Integrity. People either have it or they don't, it seems. And we generally associate the word with those who seem to have a strong moral compass, consistent principles and a bold honesty about themselves. It's just part of their character. But talking about character and living it are two different things. And when we find a man whose life radiates integrity, we should pause and learn from him. And that man is the Apostle Paul. What a man. And Luke, he contrasts for us Paul's integrity as he's there doing his own defense before Felix with the glaring lack of integrity of a certain lawyer that we've talked about the last couple of weeks that lawyer Tertullus and Luke. He doesn't say anything derogatory against the Roman governor Felix, but history records for us that Felix was a slave who gained his freedom and who rose to power through his connections. The historian Tacitus, he described Felix as one who reveled in cruelty and lust and he wielded the power of a king with the mind of a slave. His rule, it was marked by unrest and turmoil. He dealt with insurrection by crucifying hundreds of rebels. 
and Tertullus, if he could just convince Felix that this renegade man, this, this Paul, this seditious man, if he could just convince Felix, he wouldn't bother Felix's conscience in the least to crucify Paul, to cut off his head. And so here we are, we have a man of integrity up against a lawyer. A man of integrity up against a group of Jewish leaders who had tried to assassinate him. And a man of integrity up against a governor who notoriously lacked integrity. And this man, Paul, what an example of integrity that he gives us. And how we can live with integrity. We can live with integrity by speaking the truth, by living in line with scripture, and by keeping a blameless conscience before God and men. Now we're going to look at these three points in detail, along with a lesson from this courtroom event in Paul's life. But first, I want you to think about it. Think about something here. If this world were made up of basically good people, a man of integrity would be well-loved and have no enemies. But we're not made up of basically good people. This world is made up of sinners who love darkness rather than light. And since a life of integrity often exposes their evil deeds, sinners will often slander the man of integrity. Come on. And we are naive if we think that if we live integrity, we will be protected from false accusations and slanderous attempts to bring us down. And sad to say, but it could even happen in the church you attend. Amen. And you could probably state it as a rule. The more godly the man, the more he will be slandered. Now keep in mind that living with integrity does not shield us from being falsely accused. Just read the Psalms and see how often David was slandered. And of course, Jesus, who was without sin, constantly slandered. Isn't it amazing the parallels and similarities of the world of the past to the world of today? Amen. Okay, let's look at the three factors that went into Paul's integrity. First one, we can live with integrity by speaking the truth in every situation. Speaking the truth in every situation. It was Paul's in integrity that enabled him to give a calm, straightforward reply to the accusations against him. Let me remind you of the charges against him. One, Paul was a plague spreading unrest among the Jews. He was a ringleader of a heretical sect and he had tried to desecrate the Jewish temple. But Paul, he lived openly before God and before men. And he didn't have to weave a tale of half-truths. He didn't have to give out misleading statements to defend himself. Like that young boy in the courtroom. He simply spoke the truth, refuting each of the charges in order, pointing to the facts. And all you have to do is think of the repeated scandals of people in power today and how the facts of their stories change once they're caught up in the news cycle. But being a person who is consistently speaking the truth, wow, what a freeing concept. Imagine, you don't have to remember what you said to whomever and hope that those you're trying to impress don't start comparing notes. But if your life is a single fabric and you habitually speak the truth, you don't have to worry about what you said to whomever. You just speak the truth to everyone. And as Christians, that's what we're commanded to do, to speak the truth. Ephesians 4.25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Amen. We are people who speak the truth in every situation. Second factor, we can live with integrity by living in line with scripture. Come on. Here's Paul. He asserted his obedience to scripture when he told Felix, Acts 24, 14, when he told Felix and he served the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. 
when the when the Jewish ceremonial laws were fulfilled in Christ and set aside under the new covenant, God's moral law stems from his holy character and is always our standard for godly living. Being under grace never means setting aside God's moral law, but we grow in integrity and godly living only as we grow to know and understand all of God's word of truth. Come on. Yes, we can live with integrity by living in line with the scripture. And number three, we can live with integrity by keeping a blameless conscience before God and men. Amen. Blameless conscience. And that's what Paul sought to maintain always, a blameless conscience before God and before men. The concept of maintaining a good conscience is an important one in Scripture. And in fact, Paul later tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.5, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Now, conscience, it's defined as an inner feeling or voice viewed as acting as a guide to the rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. Now, living with a blameless conscience means we need to inform our consciences by God's word. If we go about comparing ourselves with others rather than with scripture, it's easy to conclude that we're doing okay. But it's God's word that penetrates like a sword. It gets down into our innermost being, judging the thoughts and intentions of our hearts and laying us bare in God's holy presence. And living with a blameless conscience means we need to live before God on the heart level. Confessing and turning away from every wrong thought, motive, attitude, word, and deed. And if we only live outwardly before men, that's a hypocrite. Oh, it's so easy to fake it in front of others, but we cannot fake it in front of God. And as our scripture, 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, I'm going to read, For our exhortation does not come from error, or impurity, or by way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Amen. Jesus said that all sin begins in the heart, Mark 7, 21 to 23. We need to get in the habit of judging it at that level before it goes any further. The recent death of the famed Christian apologist, Ravi Zacharias, someone that I've read some of his writings, watched his videos, very saddened by his death, but then following his death, the allegations, the accusations that have surfaced, detailing a dual life that he was living, it's causing much discussion in the Christian circles about this very topic of integrity before men and before God. If we do not develop the habit of judging sin at the heart level and stopping it from going any further, from crossing over a line, we are deceiving ourselves if we think that we are walking with God. And it's especially important to avoid the rationalizing and excusing our sin by blaming others. Having a blameless conscience before God means that I quickly confess and I turn away from any sin and that his word or his spirit convicts me of it, no matter what others may have done to me. And that's Paul. He stated that his practice of seeking to maintain a blameless conscience before God and men stems from the certainty, get this, it stems from the certainty of the resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So here's Paul the Apostle, now Paul the prisoner, and he gets his day in court. And the only thing Paul pled guilty to was being a Christian. Guilty of godliness, your honor, he said. And he had no attorney there to represent him, just the evidence to prove that he was a Christian. 
it's the same evidence that you and I, that we should be able to use to prove that we are Christians when we get our day in court. We get our day in court many times. It might just be some interaction with somebody. That's our day in court. Are we guilty of godliness? The first piece of evidence is being rejected by people who hate Jesus. Think about that. Until the day of Jesus' return, there will be people in the world who hate Jesus. People who hate all that the Lord stands for and people who hate everyone who belongs to the Lord. And think about the people who hate Jesus today. Many of them, they have power and prestige. They have many great gifts and abilities. Superstars in the entertainment world and so on that list goes. It's just like the Christ haters of Paul's day. How they brought some terrible accusations against Paul. Much of the world today feels the same way about believers. But Jesus told us that it would be that way. John 15, 18, God said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Being rejected by those who hate Jesus, that's great evidence to prove that we are Christians. Second piece of evidence, living with great hope. Living with great hope as the song, our hymn today, my hope is built on nothing less. Without a doubt, the Apostle Paul was living in great hope, and his hope shows up here in several ways. Here he is in the courtroom. He's cheerful while under great stress. And in verse 10, he starts his very defense before that governor saying, inasmuch as I know that you have been for me years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Paul, cheerful under great stress. And his hope led him to worship the Lord. In fact, in verse 11, he goes on to tell the governor, it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Study the Greek word for worship, and we understand why we say or we are having a worship service. Whether it's in a building or on Zoom, we are having a worship service. It's our Christian hope that helps us worship the Lord through our faithful Christian service. Reminded of a story of about the great preacher, John Wesley. He was about 21 years old when he went to Oxford University. Those younger years of Wesley, he was, well, he was a little snobbish and sarcastic. And one night something happened that changed his heart. Well, speaking with a doorman, Wesley discovered that the poor man only had one coat. And he lived in such poverty that he didn't even have a bed to sleep on at night. But yet he was an unusually happy person filled with gratitude to God. And Wesley, inconsiderately, snobbish, sarcastic individual he was at that age, he began to joke about the man's misfortune. And sarcastically he asked, so what else do you thank God for? The doorman smiled and joyfully replied, I thank him that he has given me my life and being. I thank God that he has given me a heart to love him and above all, a constant desire to serve him. Wesley, he was deeply moved by those words, by that man's hope. And that's the same kind of hope that Paul had and demonstrated, hope that helped him worship and serve the Lord. And there's more evidence Paul's hope was rooted in God's word. He goes on to say in verse 14, So I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Max Lucado, he gave a short but great testimony about the Bible, about God's word. This is what Max wrote. Every day I have the honor of sitting down with a book that contains the words of the one who created me. Every day I have the opportunity to let him give me a thought or two on how to live. And if I don't do what he says, he doesn't burn the book or cancel my subscription. 
And if I disagree with what he says, lightning doesn't split my swivel chair or an angel doesn't mark my name off the holy list. And if I don't understand what he says, he doesn't call me a dummy. In fact, he calls me son. And then on a different page, he explains what I don't understand. Remarkable. And yes, our God is remarkable. His word is remarkable. It gives us hope. Paul had great Christian hope. It was rooted in the word of God. Need more evidence? His hope reached beyond this current world. Verse 15, he, he tells Felix, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And as believers, we have hope in God, real hope that like Paul had. And we know that all of our hope comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. It was Jesus who took all the guilt for our sins when he died on the cross for us. And when we trust in the Lord, our risen savior, then we have this sure hope that we will live forever in heaven. Everyone in the world needs the hope that we have today. And everyone can have it. That's the power of hope. And living with this hope in the Lord is great evidence to prove we are Christians. Think about the tale of two cities in Acts 17 18. Think about the tale of two cities 2021 and 2022, Indianapolis to St. Louis. God figuring out a way to give the hope to other people. And if that's not enough evidence to prove his case, Paul says in verse 16, that being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. There's Paul striving to live by the highest standards that he could. And then he goes in verse 21, he gives his closing argument in his court trial there. Verse 21, he says, unless it is for this one statement, which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. In short, Paul was saying, the only thing I am guilty of is being a believer. The only thing I'm guilty of is being a believer. I think with me, it's your day in court. The charges against you, they were just read. You're charged with being a Christian. And the question is, will there be enough evidence to convict you? Now you think about that, let's pray. Our God in heaven, now again, we're just reminded of all that you have done for us, sending your son to this earth to die for us. And because of the cross, we too can have hope like Paul. We can place our trust in you like Paul did. We can have the assurance that you will be with us like you were there with Paul in prison. And that no matter the false accusations and slander that we may experience, and we know it's going to happen, but you experience it all and and you'll be with us all the way. And all you ask of us now is to remain true to you and to live a life of integrity wherever we go and to whomever we are talking with and to always remember that is living with hope in you that is the greatest evidence we need to prove that we are Christians. And Lord, our prayer today for each one of us is that when we have our day in court, whether it's just a few moments talking with someone or we actually end up in a courtroom, that there will be enough evidence to convict us. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's children said, amen.